Hello, friends and family, brothers and sisters. It says that we are live now. We have the honor and privilege of having former CIA officer uh, Larry Johnson. And back with us is Angry Warhawk. Can, can you hear me? I can hear too. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I hear you. I hear yeah. everybody fine. Good. I hear you. As they say, military five okay. by five. Military five by five. Go ahead, okay. Angry All Warhawk. Good. Go ahead, James. Okay. All right. Thank you, um, Real Truth Talk, for um, hosting this uh, live stream. Um, Larry, my first question to you is, with things uh, the way they are in, in Palestine and the Middle East, would you say that uh, this will hasten the, 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 the um, conclusion of the conflict in Ukraine? Um, how, how will this affect what's happening there? Can the United States have uh, two, essentially a two-front war of, the, of, the, of this magnitude? You know, the short answer is no. We can't fight a two-front war. We haven't been able to fight a two-front war for, you know, 20 years. I mean, look, look how well we did with Afghanistan and Iraq. You know, anybody want to chalk those up as you know, blazing successes? So you know, we 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 do not have a military force or an industrial base that can support an industrial war. So I, I've listened to Lloyd Austin say, oh, yeah, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. No, we can't. And Biden, you know, is a we're the United States of America. We're the most powerful in the world. No, we're not. If we were, we'd be able to supply Ukraine with 40,000, uh, 155 millimeter shells a month. Why? Because all we can produce a month is 19,000, which doesn't even... That's basically what they fire in one week or have fired in one week. So we can't even supply Ukraine. And now we're stepping up to supply those same artillery shells to Israel. So where is it going to come from? This is, this is not the children of Israel wandering in the desert, waking up each morning, finding manna outside their tent. But, you know, God's not going to do the delivery on this. So the United States lacks an industrial base to be able to support these kinds of wars, number one. Number two, we lack the manpower, is, and I don't say person power, but we lack the manpower in both the Army, Navy, Marine, and Air Force, not meeting recruiting goals, and with trained personnel getting the hell out as fast as they can. Uh, I just talked with a friend who's... Uh, uh, a son went to West Point, played sports at West Point. Uh, was it looking at doing a career in the U.S. Army? Uh, he's nearing his last year of obligated service. He told his dad, I, 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 I'm getting out. I can't stand this. It's so woke. They're, they're focusing on pronouns and diversity, equity, inequality, as opposed to being a military and figuring out what they need to do to be prepared to fight an enemy. So uh, the United States is not in a position to support both. And uh, you've already seen Ukraine's virtually disappeared from the newspapers in the United States. And it's certainly not popping up on the cable news shows. So they've become, uh, they're missing in action. And on top of it, though, what's going on on the ground in Ukraine is Russia is crushing them just bit by bit. And Ukraine does not have an answer. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, is do you, do you think this will this will help um, accelerate the the collapse of the Ukrainian army? Yeah, yeah. No, I think it. Um, they were all they were already on the road to you know let's call it deceleration and destruction. Hmm. Uh, and I think this is going to expedite it. Look, the the only thing that's keeping Ukraine afloat is the flow of financial aid from the United States. If this war in Israel expands and expands beyond just an Israeli Hamas conflict where you know Israel is going to be faced with having to fight a two front war with Hezbollah and Hamas, I think that's growing more likely with each passing day simply because Israel can't help itself. It just continues to bomb and kill civilians because it has no, the Israelis, the Israeli leadership, to be precise, 
They have no regard for the lives of Palestinian civilians. They're sort of like the view of that uh, uh, U.S. Army cavalry general in fighting the Indian wars with respect to Indian children. Nits make lice. Mm-hmm. So that's what you see. I mean, the kids like killing insects as far as they're concerned. And the yeah. problem with that is the social media that was not around in 2006 certainly wasn't around at the Yom Kippur War in 1973 and definitely was not around in 1967 with the Six-Day War. It's very active today. And those images of dead children, dead women, dead civilians are going out across the Muslim Arab world, and it's creating a unity that I've never seen in my entire, in my lifetime, and I'm going on 68 years of age. So uh, we've un, they've unleashed something that they can't control, and they, they cannot control or defeat it militarily. That's the point. And yet in the West, Western political leaders, they indulge that fantasy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just get enough military power over there. Let's get our aircraft carriers in there, and boy, we'll whip Hamas. Ain't going to happen. No, no. Yeah, you can see uh, the protests all over the world. I mean, everyone supporting Palestine, not not the, the governments, but the people. I mean, even in right. Europe, they're 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 despite being threatened with jail time for flying the Palestinian flag here in the mm. UK, here in the UK, they, they said, if you th- fly the Palestinian flag, then you're basically supporting Hamas. That's what they're trying to equate it with. And they're, they, they threatened to arrest people, but didn't stop these huge demonstrations all across the major cities. So people are well, ignoring it. Same in France. Right, right. But, yeah. uh, What's what's the name of the main street that runs down from the north down into Hyde Park? Uh, it begins um, with the M. The mall, M A W L, from Buckingham Palace. Do you mean? No, no, no. It's, uh, it's so is uh, up where Lord's Cricket Stadium is. Um, I'm not sure. It's not Marleybone. Um, uh, Paddington Paddington Station's near there, I believe. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, I'm not. It's a, it's a stretch yeah. of road from basically from Lord's Cricket Stadium. When you walk down that road to Hyde Park, yeah. you think you're in Beirut, Lebanon or Cairo. I mean, yeah. it's an entire it is nothing but Muslim <clears throat> Arab shops. Oh, yeah. Stores. Yeah, yeah they're not they're, talking about. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, there, there are many, many streets like that, even in the town where I live, where you, you know, you walk down the town, like you said, it's like Beirut. So and they're mm-hmm. all, of course, they're all going to support. They can't arrest everyone. I mean, it's just, you know. Well, uh, and, and that is, you know, that's what we we never saw, like, during the 73 war. You didn't see, you might see maybe 10, 20, you know, a handful of protesters coming out, speaking out in favor of the Palestinians. That's not going to yeah. be, that's not the case in the United States now. You'll get yeah. it into the thousands. And the protests that I've, I've seen on the media, so I, I put up, I tried to put up one that I posted on YouTube. From Yemen, and I wasn't making any political statement saying "Yay, go!" You know, go. No, I was just noting from a news standpoint that you were looking at three hundred thousand people at least in the streets, yeah. and wow. uh, YouTube took it down. Like, oh, this violates our community guidelines. Of course, I, I, it can't be anything stupider than these people, because if you're not going to report what's going on, then you're going to get surprised when they overrun you. Mm-hmm. It, 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 and so you're seeing those kinds of protests, not just in Yemen and Sana'a. You're you're seeing them in Peshawar, Pakistan. You're seeing them in Ankara, Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, you're seeing them in Saudi Arabia. You're seeing it in Jordan, it, it, in Iraq, in Iran. You know, nations that normally would not necessarily collaborate with one another, they're all coming together on this because they're mm-hmm. seeing these images of these dead children. And you know the outrage that was stirred up in the United States and Europe with that false report that Hamas was beheading 40 children. Oh my God. The re- I mean, you know, people were out of their minds with it. Yeah. Well, why do we think that the people in Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, Indonesia, for God's sake, why do we think that they're not going to be similarly outraged when they see real photographic evidence because there was no photographic evidence uh, of, of those supposedly 
beheaded Israeli children, but there absolutely is real, not artificial intelligence generated, but real images of these Palestinian children that are being killed. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and it's it's it, it's igniting a flame. All I can do is warn people it's igniting a flame. Don't think you can kill your way out of this. You can't. And when it ha and when it reaches that point of detonation, it's going to involve attacks on Americans and American interests. Okay, um, Larry, I sent you um, an article, and I just wanted to know if you could just uh, get your quote because if the article is fake, it's basically claiming that an Israeli commander that Israel that they let it happen on purpose. What are your thoughts on that? I I disagree with that uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, yes, there is evidence that over the years, uh, the Israelis, particularly the Bibi Net Netanyahu side of the party, has provided financial support to Hamas. And that, I think, was seen as a way to try to weaken the uh, authority of the Palestinian Liberation Organization. And that I think Israel always assumed they could contain the threat. But uh, the notion that uh, they knew that this attack was coming and let it happen, uh, if, if Bibi Netanyahu had been elected with 80% of the popular support and then had full confidence that everybody in his government were behind him, yeah, I might entertain that as a possibility, but that's not the case. He barely, he did not win a majority of the votes. He, he won a plurality. He had to cut deals with a variety of right-wing parties and others. And when you're looking at the three major intelligence organizations in Israel, between Mossad, Shin Bet, and Unit 8200, what, you, what you're faced with is the, the likelihood that there are people working in the Mossad, Shin Bet, and 80, Unit 8200, which is their SIGINT uh, capability, like our NSA, who don't like Bibi Netanyahu and would leak out in a heartbeat the evidence that they knew that this was coming and did nothing. Now, Israel was clearly caught with its pants down. And people say, oh, yeah, but that, that can't be. Israel is always so prepared. Really? So I don't know if you guys got any of the uh, email appeals to help buy body armor for the Israeli soldiers because they don't have body armor. And that, that's not a scam. The, Irish, the, the, uh, the Israeli Times newspaper reported on it. That they, that with all the money that the Israeli army has received from the United States and from Jewish organizations in the United States over the years, Nobody ever thought it important to sit down and buy body armor to make sure that every soldier in Israel has body armor. So if they're going to overlook something as fundamental and basic as that, why assume that they're going to be smart in other areas? They've already shown with that that they're a bunch of dumbasses. Excuse me, but it, I, I mean, just the, the disconnect between what I call the Israeli propaganda about, oh, we're so great, we are so good. And then they don't even get their guys' body armor. And yet they want to send them into ground combat in an urban environment. Yeah, that makes sense. Can, um, can the, the, uh, the, the IDF defeat Hamas from the air alone? Or do they no. need to put boots on the ground? Yeah, they're, they're going to have to put boots on the ground. They'll right. get... You know, go back to World War II. The, you remember it was the, the Brits and the American uh, that were in the Army Air Corps, uh, Hap Arnold and others, they, they believed, oh, uh, all we got to do is bomb the Germans into submission. That'll beat them. Well, no, it didn't. And the, those air crews in the 8th Air Force suffered probably the highest casualty rate of any military unit uh, throughout the war. So... Uh, it was just, it, it's that myth. You know, we're going to defeat the Vietnamese from the air. No, that didn't work out. How about Iraq? You had total air supremacy there. No, yeah. you had to put troops in on the ground. Syria, I mean, just, you know, show me one instance 
where air power has accomplished that. It's impossible. And yet sort of the irony here is as Israel bombs these areas in the Gaza Strip and creates piles and piles of rubble, they're sort of doing what the Nazis did when they invaded Stalingrad uh, in 1940, in August of 1942, that they, uh, they thought that this was going to wipe out the Soviet defenders and make the city easier to conquer. And instead, it had the exact opposite effect. It created obstacles that Nazi German, the German tanks, the Wehrmacht tanks, could not navigate. They couldn't maneuver. And it created cover and concealment positions for Soviet fighters, where that they could ambush uh, advancing German units. Well, same thing is going to happen in Gaza. That yeah. you know, Hamas, unless we're just we've been completely misled, and that's I guess always a possibility. Hamas has taken advantage of the last several years to dig underground tunnels, to dig underground bunkers, to stock fuel, to stock water, to stock food, to stock medical supplies, and most importantly, to stock ammunition. And God knows what they picked up on the black market coming out of Ukraine or out of Afghanistan. I mean, there are ample supplies of weapons out there that I'm sure the Afghans might be willing to share willingly with Hamas and not charge them anything. How have Hamas managed to smuggle weapons into such a tiny strip of land? Yeah, it's, um, you know, the old expression, money talks. <laughs> so yeah. where there's a dollar to be made, the black market operates quite freely. And in yeah. fact, those tunnels that come in from Egypt into, into the Gaza Strip, uh, those sometimes those are joint business deals between Israelis and Palestinians. So you shouldn't oh, wow. kid ourselves that this is just only the Palestinians. You, you've got some Israeli businessmen involved with this as well, uh, making money off of it. Yeah. Hmm. Um, Larry, there's a, uh, I want to see if we could address this one. It says, are the Ukraine neo-Nazis supporting Israel? And if so, what does that look like? <laughs> yeah, strange bedfellows. That's exactly what they're doing. Uh, you know, they're following the U.S. script. They recognize, look, Ukraine recognizes that if it's supported, uh, you know, now think about this. You've got ISIS, Muslim extremists, fighters fighting on behalf of Ukraine against Russia. And yet Ukraine, realizing that if it came down on the side of the Palestinians, that their, their economic support in the United States would disappear like that. Every single Jewish member of Congress would be up in arms finally. And it's a new, not another dime or cent uh, for those Nazis in Kiev. And yet, uh, you know, here you've got these, these guys who ideologically believe that Israel should be wiped from the face of the earth for their own survival. They're embracing Israel and ta talking it up that, oh, yeah, we, need, we stand with Israel. Uh, it's, you know, just... There's no there's no ideological, you know, consistency in the world. You take that to the bank. Yeah. Um, would you say the uh, the 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 tank is an out of date weapon? It, it seems yeah. they seem to be especially vulnerable. I mean, they've already. I'm not sure how many tanks they've already lost even now, but I've counted at least three or four of those Merkava tanks that have been sent to the scrapyard. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just there. They're, you know, it's, it's dated technology and there's not a uh, the only thing that would make uh, the tank conceivably a viable uh, weapon going forward would be able to remotely drive it and shoot it without uh, having a crew inside. So then mm -hmm. it's just like a drone, you know, you can shoot it down. OK, so we lost the drone. Uh, let's let's go get another one. The problem is that it, the systems have become so expensive and so heavy uh, that uh, even though they're, they can present a terrifying image, the weaponry between drones and anti-tank guided missiles, you know, take them out in a heartbeat. So we're sort of we're sort of reaching the same stage as happened at the start of World War II, where they still several uh, unit 
uh, armies of the world, including Germans and the United States, still had horse cavalry. Well, the horse cavalry couldn't stand up against machine guns, but they still had them. And it took them another couple of years to finally get rid of them. Um, they're finding that these tanks in, in this modern combat era with, you know, guided missiles and guided drones that can be fired from a distance, the, the, the tanks are extremely vulnerable. And, and notice what it did. And, you know, we, we got the example in Ukraine. They stopped using the tanks and the armored personnel carriers because they said, oh, we're switching to a new tactic. Oh, what brilliant tactic is that? Oh, we're, we're going to drop the guys seven kilometers from the front line and make them walk in. Now, anybody that's ever carried a military pack with, uh, let's say, a thousand rounds of ammunition to fire in a, in a fully automatic a firearm knows that right off the bat you're talking about 40 pounds of weight 30 and 40 pounds add that water that you need because you don't want to just have a canteen you probably want to have a couple of gallons of water because you're going to go through that particularly if it's hot at all uh, in, in, a, in a short period of time yeah. and you might want to have some food and then that rifle you're carrying well the rifle itself is probably weighing around 10 pounds if it's any good, you know, they got a lot of lightweight crap they can give you that's not going to hold up in combat. And so you got to, you got to schlep all of that over seven kilometers. And when you go through that thousand rounds in about 20 minutes, where are you going to get the resupply from? So that's their brilliant strategy. Yeah, <laughs> that's going to work. And, and so it just, I mean, it, what, what we're seeing is just, the, the complete disconnect of Western military advisors from having any clue what it is to actually fight in this kind of environment. And, and, and so with ISR being what ISR is, we, we've never fought a war against a peer where you've had co-equal intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance. That, that eliminates the ability to consolidate, gather forces, and move them surreptitiously it makes it very, very difficult. Just going back to the tank a second, how guided missiles are nothing new though. Why is it now tanks are all of a sudden so vulnerable? Because there there have been anti tank weapons, you know, for, for as long as the tank's been around. So why is it now? I know the drones are particularly dangerous because they can be yeah. dropped, you know, from overhead. But why is because it anti-tank now, weapons? Yeah, because now it's easier. You can more quickly identify where the tank is right. and get those geo coordinates into a firing solution. Yeah. Uh, you can do that within a minute or two. Before you had, you know, without effective ISR, you had to wait till some guy up on the front line said, I think I hear a tank coming. And then you call it in. Well, what's the coordinates? Well, you know, you got to eyeball it. You think, uh, you know, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the geo cords uh, that you can fire on and then we'll see how to adjust, you know, Hey, that's all changed. you got, you got the eye in the sky. This is like uh, the Lord you know, Sauron, the eye of Sauron from Lord of the Rings, all seeing, all knowing. Yeah. Okay. Um, Larry, what are, what are your thoughts on the possibility of Hezbollah and other countries entering the Palestinian is Israeli conflict? Is this the reason why the U.S. has deployed a second U.S. carrier striker group to the Middle East? Yeah, yeah, probably. And they'll find out the same thing they did in 1983, that that's a stupid thing to do. Um, my understanding is Hezbollah has already taken out, I was told, every, uh, Alistair Cook, uh, Cook reported this, every observation tower along uh, the Lebanese-Israel border. And, and if that's the case, Israel now is somewhat blind. They still have their drones and overhead imagery that it can supply. But those those watchtowers are now down. Uh, they've been taken out. So uh, mm -hmm. I actually I fully expect just judging from some of the some of the scenes, the coverage of uh, uh, Al Jazeera, what's coming out. Uh, they were they were at a Baptist hospital. OK, think about this. We're not talking about a Muslim hospital. We're not talking a Red Crescent hospital. We're talking a Baptist. 
Give me that old time religion, Baptist hospital in Gaza. The Israelis bombed it, and they killed about 200 civilians in the process. So that news is now flashing around the Middle East. I think that's going to put increased pressure on Hezbollah to fully open up that second front uh, in the north. And then it's also, uh, don't discount the likelihood of seeing the West Bank erupt. So Israel will have be fighting on three different fronts, and it doesn't have the manpower, and it certainly doesn't have the body armor to fight on three fronts. We know that. So that hospital that you're talking about, that was bombed this morning, right, about an hour yes. ago? Yeah, just about a couple hours ago. Mm. Yeah, and we're saw, talking a Baptist. We're not talking a Muslim place. We're talking a Baptist hospital. Last yeah. time I checked, the Baptists are not in bed with Hamas. Yeah, I think this is a mistake people make. They think that this is about, you know, Muslim versus Jewish. No, Palestinians yeah. are, there are many, okay, the majority, yes, are Muslim, but there are many, many Christian Palestinians. I mean, they're, I mean, right. I mean there's Palestinian Jews as well. I mean, they, but anyway, I won't get into it, but no, it's, it's, it's not about, it's nothing to do with religion. That's, that's an important point that people really need to understand. I think, I think especially in America and here in Britain too, people think that, but it's, it's, it's a complete misconception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so my, my next question is, we know Iran is probably um, Israel's biggest um, opponent in the region, in the region, certainly. Yeah. And what what can Iran actually do? Because they don't share a border. Uh, so what what would be their what what can they physically do? Well, let's let's Israel? first let's let's first sort of get the correct history and put this in perspective because most people don't know it. They're not, you know, if you're, if you're really under the age of 60, you probably don't remember. Uh, after the Ayatollah Khomeini took over in Iran in December of 1979, uh, Iran uh, was uh, faced with uh, the potential of a war being attacked by Iraq, which uh, happened. So I think the war started in the fall, uh, September of 1980. So who was the major supplier of weapons to Iran? Now, remember, we're talking the same guys that were holding Americans hostage, the Iranians, the same guys that were starting to carry out terrorist attacks against uh, U.S. and Israeli targets around the world. The major supplier of weapons at that time to Iran was... Israel. Mm. Israel continued to supply weapons to Iran up to 1988. So for eight years. And initially, until the, the Iranian involvement in blowing up the U.S. Embassy in Beirut, the United States gave Israel permission to supply those weapons to Iran. Think about that. You know, the hypocrisy involved. And oh yeah, at the same time, the United States was also supplying weapons and technological equipment to Iraq so that Iraq could produce chemical weapons that they used to attack Iran with. So United United States was like, you know, we were like some corrupt Wall Street trader. We were on both sides of the trade. We we're supplying, you know, supplying Iran, supplying Iraq. Hey, let them kill each other. That, that makes the world safer for us. Pretty cynical. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, Iran and Israel right now are like that divorced couple, you know, that hates each other. They were married at one point, but now they hate each other and, you know, see each other as Satan incarnate. But there's, you know, within that, there was still a foundation of a relationship between the two. Uh, it, it, Iran... Iran has much as much of a grievance against Israel as Israel does against Iran. You know, Israel is implicated in the murder of at least four Iranian nuclear scientists inside Iran. Now, how do you think Israel would react if Iran sent a hit squad to Israel and assassinated four of the leading Israeli scientists on the nuclear program? They would be outraged, legitimately so. That's an act of war. 
So my only point, I'm not trying to draw a moral equivalence here, but it's saying, for God's sake, that recognize nobody's got clean hands in any of this. And nobody's got pure motives in any of this. What you see is Israel and Iran each acting in what they perceive as their national interest. And to that extent, uh, Iran worried about Iran, uh, Israel continuing to attack it. It's going to do everything in its power to weaken Israel. And Israel, from its standpoint, wanting to do everything it can to weaken Iran. The difference is Iran has a lot more tools at its disposal and personnel. Uh, they can infiltrate people in to the border of Israel through Syria and through Lebanon and through Jordan and through Egypt. So there's uh, they've got a lot of options. Israel it does not have aircraft that have the capability to reach and bomb inside Iran. Even if they did, the, you know, one or two, even a fleet uh, of combat aircraft are not going to do anything to decisively weaken Iran. If anything, it would be a, a strike that would so enrage Iran that Iran would go all out to destroy Israel. So I think that's why it's it, it's really uh, what we need is some adult leadership to step in and try to you know get these two sides separated, stop the fighting, stop the bloodshed, because otherwise it's going to spin out of control. And the United States is accustomed to believing that we can sort of control because we're the most powerful in the world, as Joe Biden was saying. Well, we're no longer in that position. We still believe we are, but the, the world's changed. Uh, look at what happened to Tony Blinken the other day. He went to Saudi Arabia. Now, in, in the past, frankly, when, when a, you know, the Secretary of State would show up in Saudi Arabia, the Saudis would kiss our ass. What did they do to Blinken the other day? Blinken shows up. He's supposed to have a meeting at like 7 p.m. on Saturday night with uh, Ben Salman, Mohammed Ben Salman. And what does Ben Salman do? Ah, the, his guys put Tony Blinken on ice. They said, oh, yeah, he'll be with you in a bit. He'll be with you in a bit. They kept him up all night, all night long, as we were laughing about earlier with the song. And it was only about 8 o'clock in the morning that Ben Salman comes out and says, okay, well, hi, what can I do for you? <laughs> and after, you know, they both issued a statement. Uh, the, the State Department did its best to put lipstick on that pig and make it look pretty. Uh, but, uh, you know, the bottom line was from uh, Ben Salman's standpoint, Saudi Arabia was standing with Palestine not with Israel. And so the United States ability to control this has evaporated. Same same sort of reaction in Egypt. They didn't they didn't uh, disrespect the Blinken in that same way, but they told him very, you know, matter of factly up front, yeah, what Hamas did was bad. They shouldn't have done that, but what Israel is doing is worse. Yeah. Um yeah, completely. I just want to say I put I put um, the article that you wrote the article that you were just talking about, I put mm -hmm. that up on the just on the comments. So if anybody wanted, I, I would like to encourage you guys to go check out this uh, article written by Larry Johnson. It's uh, it's informative and it's it's also funny at the same time. <laughs> so you'll see what Larry Johnson is talking about. So if you can go check out that, uh, I put it on the on the comments section. And then uh, I'll, I'll follow that that answer that you just gave. Um, there's another question. It's, it has to do with the same thing you were just talking about. Who or what side of the military conflict between Hamas and, and the IDF has the moral high ground, in your opinion, which I think you already said? Uh, it, it, it really depends on who you support. I, I'm in sort of a pox on both their houses. Or let me put it this way. I believe that Israel, as a nation, has a right to exist. And that, that should have been acknowledged by countries like Iran, Saudi Arabia. But I also believe that the Palestinians have a right to have a free country, which they do not. Uh, you know, the, the sad irony in this is that Israel was born out of the ember of the Holocaust of World War II. And I know there are a bunch of Holocaust deniers that claimed, oh, you know, that's a lie. It's not. Uh, that Germany made a very uh, concentrated effort to try to exterminate Jews uh, in Europe and in 
uh, Eastern Europe, particularly going into Ukraine and Russia. And it's a long story, but it goes back to the belief that because of Trotsky and his Jewish roots, that the, the entire Bolshevik movement was Jewish. You know, so that, that was sort of the context. So the creation of the state of Israel was to provide a, a safe haven, a place where the survivors of the Holocaust could live. But they turned around and basically expelled the Palestinians. And, you know, the, this is a fight over land. Who's got the right to be there first? And, you know, I think either side, you know, they, they, everybody wants to go back into history. And good God, you go back to Adam and Eve probably to try to sort this out. And it, it means that each side can make a very, each side makes a very compelling case why this country should be theirs. And, you know, I, I, so I don't think anyone's got moral high ground here. I, the, look, the reality, the statistical reality, over the last 10 years, if you total up the number of Israelis that were killed in terrorist attacks by Hamas, Hezbollah, and any other crazed uh, Islamic group you want to point to, killed and wounded, and you've totaled up the number of Palestinians killed and wounded, not just Hamas and Hezbollah, but Palestinian civilians killed and wounded by Israel. It's about a 20 to 1 difference. For every one Israeli killed, it's 20 Palestinians or more. So you want to talk moral high ground? From that standpoint, Palestinians have the moral high ground. The Israelis have been killing far more civilians and the, the, the just complete disregard for the lives of the Palestinians. It's, as That's how it is perceived in the bulk of the Arab Muslim world. And I know if we, if we, you know, I've got terrific close friends who are Jewish and very much pro-Israel, and they, they'd probably argue this point with me, and that's fine. Uh, and it's not, I'm, I'm not trying to diminish the threat that Israel faces, but they, they play the Holocaust card that if we don't do this, they're going to destroy us. Therefore, we need to destroy them. But in the process, they end up destroying children and innocent civilians in the same way that the Germans destroyed Jewish children and civilians in World War II. That is the sickening irony of all this. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, yeah, they, I mean, they're denied basic living essentials. I mean, the Gaza is just like a big concentration camp for all intents and purposes because they mm -hmm. control absolutely everything that goes in and out. And I think they get only like two hours of electricity at some point mm -hmm. in a 24 hour period. Um, the water they get is not drinkable, so they have to treat it once it comes in. I mean, now they now they got no water. They've cut it off. But correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's it's. It's just a, a grotesque um, display of, of human behavior towards um, a group of people. And, and they, they, they don't differentiate between combatants and non-combatants. I mean, they're literally just they've even I've, I've even set, seen IDF soldiers saying that we're at war with civilians and Hamas. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, for, for them, yeah. it's the same thing. They don't see them. And it's because they view them. They don't view them. They, they see them as subhumans. Going back to you know World War II and how the you know the, the German ideology, or should I say the Nazi ideology, um, it's the same thing. Their, their view they view Palestinians as literal subhumans. That's why they have no problem bombing them and and now and then let alone in in peacetime when they treat them um, like animals because that's what they see them. They see them as animals, which is quite disturbing. So well, yeah, I mean it's yeah. yeah I was just gonna say remember the last time. A city, you know, the size of uh, the Gaza Strip uh, was surrounded by a military force. Uh, we're talking the Nazis surrounding Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, in, in, in Russia. That uh, the, the military commanders of those units were held for war crimes because of what they did in trying to besiege that city, cutting off food, fuel, water, you know, the... The only thing that really saved uh, the Soviet citizens who survived that was the ability to get some resupplies across a frozen lake uh, during the winter. So, I mean, and that siege went on for more than a year uh, before they, they were uh, finally liberated. And, and, you know, Israel can 
you know, you can say, hey, we were attacked, and you know, fine, that's true. They have a they have a right to respond, but the problem is they are drawing no distinction between civilian and military, and they don't care. Many don't care anyway. I'm sure there are some who do. <clears throat> Um, Larry, I was going to ask you, um, or were you good, um, James? You good? Did yeah, you yeah no, no, okay, you go ahead. No, okay. I'm good. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead with your next question. Um, Larry, I wanted to ask you, how could, you know, this is like from the beginning, sorry, I should have asked this one first, but how could uh, is the Israeli intelligence miss the Hamas invasion plans? Um, it's real easy. Uh, number one, if you don't have, if you start relying more upon electronic intercepts, uh, intercepting social media, computer communications, telephones, etc., cetera, um, that's one way uh, that you, you miss it. Um, and and I, I have, I talked to a friend of mine. He was, uh, he was a senior manager within Army Intelligence. It was called Insum. And he, he, he told me about his experience on the morning of 9-11, after the planes had hit the towers, that as he was going through the, the, the information that was provided by the National Security Agency the previous day, he came upon a message that was warning about that attack hmm. and exactly how it was going to unfold. In, in other words, it was the United States had collected it, but there's no automatic system within the bureaucracy, within the technology to say, hey, this is really important. You better pay attention to this. So uh, that coupled with, let's call it hubris, arrogance on the part of the Israelis. Uh, you know, I've dealt with the Israelis over the years. Um, and one of their problems, shortcomings, is that they, they've developed a lot of arrogance which couples means they they have no respect whatsoever for the palestinians and the arabs they assume that they are superior far superior and that they're even better than the americans at most things in some cases they are but that, that combination of arrogance and laziness on in terms of collecting information and, and you saw that the head of shin bed actually came out and admitted okay i was it was our my bad our fault what's he still doing on the job why hasn't he been fired you know why haven't they brought somebody in to correct the situation and you know we saw that in the united states in the aftermath of 9 11. not a single person in the chain of command who could have should have known what was going on lost their job mm -hmm. you know, they got promoted or they got lucrative contracts after government so that, you know the, what, what you're seeing is how this kind of thing happens, the lack of accountability, big bureaucracies, too much information with over-reliance on electronic intercepts, and lack of reliance upon individuals. This means uh, the Israelis would have had to have recruited a Hamas operative, someone in that had access to the Hamas leadership that would have been apprised of what they were planning to do. And... Uh, Israel apparently did not have that. I know the United States certainly does not have that. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to address um, a couple of the comments. Uh, going back earlier, someone mentioned the uh, the tank was uh, lost. They lost large numbers of tanks in World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, but does this mean the tank was a failure? And my, my, I would address that with... No, because back in World War II, they could churn out a thousand tanks a month. Whereas yeah. today, it takes, I think they can barely produce a thousand tanks a year, if that. I mean, oh, tanks they can't, can't even do that. Mass. Yeah, can't even I mean, do it's, that. no, no, exactly. So it's just yeah. a numbers game. They can't keep up. Yeah, I mean, the tank, you know, the, the, both sides had tanks. The Germans probably had, they had superior tanks in terms of firepower. And armor in some cases, uh, they were so big that they could not properly maneuver in the field as the war progressed. And whereas the T-54 that uh, the Russians came out with was just the absolute the su superior tank in World War II of all, you know, whether American, British, 
uh, or German uh, because they could produce it in massive volumes. It did have carried enough of a punch that it could knock out German tanks. And yeah, they, they, they got shot up and destroyed. Uh, and uh, But Russia could easily replace them. That was, that was sort of the beauty of that as a weapons system. Uh, yeah. The same went for, you know, fighter, combat fighter aircraft, like the P-51 Mustang. Um, that, yeah, those would get shot down, but they could turn turn one out within two or three days uh, yeah. at, at, a, at the U.S. aircraft uh, manufacturing plant. Now you lose an F-35, you're looking at a year. Mm-hmm. So wow. it's just developing more technologically sophisticated <laughs> weapons today, and that's especially true with tanks means that the turnaround uh, period for getting them reproduced and out in the field has become quite uh, extended. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, I mean, the, the I was saying with the, the Sherman tank, I mean, that wasn't exactly a very good tank, but they built so no. many of them. It didn't matter how many they lost. They could just flood the enemy. I think, and I think it was a Stalin that said, um, he said, okay, yes, quality uh, maybe better than quantity but quantity has a quality of its own or, or something along those lines yeah so it yeah. was and it's true it's it's true if you have you know you can just swamp the enemy with thousands and thousands of tanks it doesn't matter how many you lose you, you're going to destroy the enemy so it's in a war of attrition that's just how how it works yeah in fact i looked i looked up once so when when the operation barbarossa kicked off um in uh, i guess 1941 that the Soviet Union then had to reload. They had a lot of their production facilities in the Donbass, in and around Kiev, and in what is currently Ukraine. And so they had to shift a lot of those back to the east over the Ural Mountains to get them out of range. And that just imagine disassembling a factory and moving it. So starting from... January of 1942, when the United States had finally, you know, we were now in the war and uh, the Soviet Union had been in the war uh, for uh, six months uh, against uh, the Germans. You compare the ability to produce tanks. The Russians produced as many tanks as the Americans did from 19 from January 42 to May of 1945. So. But the the Soviets did it. It was the equivalent of having to pack up your tank factory in Chicago and move it to Alaska and set it up again and get going with production. Think about that. Yeah. So it mean, means really the the Soviets in terms of time period were actually churning out more tanks than the United States had the ability, even with all of our industrial might. And, and that's that's always one of the misperceptions we've had with respect to Russia, that we yeah. assume that they are a, an industrial weakling when it's just the opposite. Yeah, no, they're a powerhouse for sure. Yeah, they moved all their factories b- behind the Ural Mountains out outside of, out of reach of the 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 Luftwaffe. That was the whole point. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, that was must have been an incredible uh, <clears throat> operation. So, yeah. Okay. Um, Juan, did you have, was it your turn or? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Larry, as an ex-CIA, what are your feelings towards the bombing campaign Israel has launched in the Gaza Strip? It is well known that Hamas exit exists underground in mm-hmm. their tunnels, which intertwine with civilian infrastructure. Israel will argue it's a tactic Hamas employs and in essence uses Palestinian c- civilians as shield. Who is yeah. at fault here? Well, uh, it's what Israel's doing is counterproductive. It's I put it in the feel good category. You know, you're angry, you want to lash out at somebody and hurt them and make them pay. Uh, but you know, they, they do a couple of things in this. One, uh, as we talked about earlier, you create rubble that can be that will hinder the movement of Israeli troops if they decide to go in on the ground. It'll make them more vulnerable, not less vulnerable. So from that standpoint, it's counterproductive. The other thing they focused on, and they've given a lot of talk, and they're you know putting out the information. Oh boy, we killed uh, you know Abu Jamal or whoever the current uh, leader of Hamas is, and they're they're making a big deal about killing the leadership of Hamas. 
without understanding how dangerous that is. Uh, we learned that lesson. Well, I wouldn't say we clearly people haven't learned that lesson. But during the during the uh, terrorist war in Algeria, there was a group called uh, the Armed Islamic Group. Uh, the, I guess Grupo Islami Armi was the French. And uh, the, the French came up with the idea, oh, if, if we kill the leadership, you know, like cutting the head off a chicken, the body will die. Well, what they didn't understand was that the leadership of the armed Islamic group, as radical as they appeared, they actually were a moderating influence on younger people within the hierarchy who wanted to do more radical more bloodthirsty, more violent acts. And that when you killed those top level of leaders, that control disappeared. And those people, those junior leaders took over or split off and went off and did their own thing. We experienced the same thing in the, you know, the, with the Kingpin program. Uh, one of my former business partners, he was he was the brains behind the Kingpin program, which the idea was you take out the top leaders of the Medellin cartel or the Cali cartel and the Sinaloa cartel and the Valle del Norte cartel. Take out those senior leadership and you will kill the cartel. You'll kill the business. Nope, you don't. It's just like hitting a ball of mercury with a hammer. If you've ever done that, you hit it and the mercury scatters and uh, it, it, it remains you know, becomes a new independent unit and you lose control. So the, one of the most likely outcomes, I think, of this um, Israeli offensive is, yeah, they'll kill some of the Hamas leadership and they will create, I think, a more dangerous entity, not a less dangerous entity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they say the devil, you know, I think that's uh, yeah. good expression um not that i'm saying hamas is is the devil i i i'm not saying that at all um i feel they have a legitimate i mean they're basically just the the the, the palestinians fighting with with guns because they don't have an army they don't have a, a, a legitimate or should i say a legit they don't have any um uh, military apparatus so that's that's no, the only way they're they basically can... they're a guerrilla force they're not like yeah. hezbollah hezbollah is actually a real army uh, Hezbollah's a real Hezbollah, army. Okay. Hezbollah's yeah. got artillery. They've got tanks. They march in formation. Uh, they're oh, they're wow, a disciplined okay. force. I don't know how much of that, let's call it the Hezbollah strategy, has transferred over to uh, the Hamas fighters over the last, you know, well, 17 years. Because yeah. in 2006, when Israel invaded southern Lebanon, it basically got its ass kicked. They went in, oh, we're going to roll over this uh, Hezbollah. They're a bunch of, you know, raghead wearing terrorists, and we're going to defeat them. And what they encountered was, you know, Hezbollah was no longer that uh, group of raghead wearing terrorists. They were wearing helmets, and they were outfitted in uniforms, and they had uh, uh, built uh, defensive positions and trenches and pillboxes, and they had set up inter interlacing lines of fire that uh, would uh, defeat uh, uh, Israeli uh, armor, which it did. So, uh, you know, Israel was shocked. And the thing that sort of worries me is in that entire war in 2006, I think the Israelis only lost, I'm not trying to minimize losses, but they, they lost 251 men. Uh, They've lost far more than that in that initial attack by Hamas. Hmm. You know, they ignore the set aside the civilian casualties inflicted by Hamas, which, in my view, is a war crime as well. I you know, don't give them a pass on that at all. But what Hamas accomplished in attacking hardened Israeli military positions was uh, very significant. And I think just scared the hell out of Israel because it, they, they hadn't seen this before. And the way they use drones in a coordinated attack, uh, it was, uh, you know, it really created a problem for Israel. So, and, and I think, you know, frankly, if Hamas had done that instead of, you know, grabbing up Israeli civilians, kidnapping them, taking them hostage, and killing uh, some of the civilian settlers, uh, 
if they hadn't done that, I think their their propaganda victory would have been even more impressive because uh, that the, the civilian the, the war crimes against civilians did tarnish uh, the, that part of the story. Didn't Hamas take uh, an IDF general? I know they took several officers prisoner as well as uh, soldiers, but didn't they take a general? I, I haven't I haven't heard that, so I don't know. And it was like in the Possible. first day. Um, I, I think I, I think it may have even been. I don't know if it was verified, but apparently it was verified by the IDF. But mm -hmm. if if that is the case, I mean that would would that would they use? I mean, surely they would use that to leverage um, Israel to release Palestinian prisoners. Yeah, yeah. This is um, remember I was at State Department during the entire uh, American hostage in Beirut, Lebanon escapade. You know, it started in 1985, 86, and it continued until 1992. Wow. So the, the only way we got those hostages, that was through negotiation. There was no, uh, we, we did not, we were not able to use Delta Force or SEAL Team 6, none of the special operations units. I mean, they were ready to go try, but we couldn't even find them, could not even locate them, did not know where they were. Uh and during that entire time frame. And so I, I suspect uh, Hamas can do the same thing that Hezbollah did back then. And they can keep them indefinitely. It, it's, look, holding hostages, it, it's a pain in the ass. It's like, you know, it's like you trying to take care of a dog that's not housebroken and you can't let it outside. Uh, you're you're going to be cleaning up a mess all the time. And multiply that times 200. So, uh, not not pretty. Yeah. Wow. Well, Larry, we appreciate your time. Um, I got one more question, and I want to just it's a, it's about Russia, a Russia yeah. question. Uh, if I could throw that in, please. And then this would be the last question, unless uh, Russia. What's maybe, what's Russia? Yeah. <laughs> right. That that, that, seems, that seems like such a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um. The question is, what what will be the extreme elements in Ukraine do, or yeah, you know, what would they do with the loss of support from the U.S. Empire and its vessels to Israel, a Jewish nation? Yeah, the, uh, well, I think right now the, the general policy, as we discussed earlier, they're not going to do anything to offend the United States. But if aid to Ukraine is cut off because of Israel, uh, you know, I could see a scenario in which at least some on the, uh, the what they call the U Ukrainian Nazi elements would actually go to fight with uh, Palestinians. You know, I, I could see that as a possibility. But, you know, what Russia what Russia is going to face at that point will be a potential counterinsurgency. And you know, some people doubt the ability of Russia to do that, except Russia's already done that. It was called the Chechen War. They fought about a nine-year war in Chechnya. It took them a while, but they wiped out the Islamic extremists. I mean, they wiped them out. Uh, and they were able to do that because uh, they share a common language and a common culture, despite a difference in religious views. And uh, it, it, Russia has that same advantage when it comes to Ukraine. Can I get one more question? Yeah, can I get one more? <laughs> sure. Um, Syria, are, do you predict Syria will make a move to reclaim the Golan Heights? Uh, <clears throat> not yet. But uh, if, if the war expands, so if Hamas enters the war, if Hezbollah enters the war alongside with Hamas, and then you get attacks coming from both uh, Lebanon and Syria, yeah, I could see them making a definite play to regain uh, control of that. Uh, right now, you, you know, Syria's, Syria's status has dramatically changed from what it was a year ago. A year ago, it was ostracized. It was not part of the, it was still kept out of the Arab League, having been expelled back uh, in 2012. Uh, now it's back in. And uh, it's back in the Organization of, of Islamic States as well. So, uh, it is 
it's in a much stronger position, both politically, diplomatically. And Israel has still been carrying out attacks on airfields at Aleppo and in Damascus. And it would not surprise me to see Russia say, all right, this is going to stop. And they'll move in an S-300 battery or two and we'll shoot down uh, incoming Israeli aircraft in, in the future going forward. Which yeah, Israel I mean, can't afford to lose. Yeah, I mean for years. I mean it's not just recently. But they've been bomb. They've been bombing Syria intermittently for years. I mean yeah, this isn't the first yeah. time they've hit Aleppo or, or the other airport. They they keep doing it. And in Syria, it just amazes me that Syria doesn't respond. They they've been really good at restraining. I mean, is it maybe is it because they can't respond or? Yeah, it's it's basically they can't. Now, right, right. Th this this opens up sort of an interesting. Uh, a diplomatic avenue for there's a way Russia I think can convey the message to Israel that basically you you cut this shit out or else we're going to be in a position where we're going to have to assist the government of Syria and leave it at that without specifying what assist the government of Syria means but Israel would figure it out it means providing them with air defense systems that Israel would be vulnerable to not to mention yeah. the possibility of providing Syria with offensive weaponry that Syria could use against Israel in the same way that Israel is using U.S. weaponry against Syria. Yeah. Play tit for tat. It's like, all right, if that's the way you want to go, we can go that way. But I, I think you know, Russia is genuinely, with China, trying to seek a negotiated outcome that will separate the two sides, that will stop the killing in Gaza, and that will get a legitimate peace process back on the table. But uh, the problem is uh, the current government in Israel is run by a corrupt, crazy guy, Bibi Netanyahu. Yeah. So is, is Russia going to have to pick a side? Because it seems like I know Russia has good relations with both uh, the, the Zionist regime in Israel and um, and Syria. So they're kind of they well, have I to think, choose a side. So I think it, gonna... I think Russia has already chosen the. the they're siding with Palestine because because of what Israel did in supplying uh, weapons and fighters, at least that's the perception from Russia, uh, yeah. to Ukraine. Ukraine, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, they've absolutely supplied weapons and even manpower, I think. Um, right. Yeah. Well, we, right. we appreciate you, Larry, for um, all your information. And uh, yeah, my, wanted... my, apo my apologies for showing up late. I no, Sorry. you're fine. You're good. We appreciate you for all your information. And I want to encourage everybody to go. I have it on the screen. Uh, go check out this article. It's, 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 it's a good, informative article, and it's also funny. It'll make you laugh. Uh, I want you, you guys to uh, encourage you guys to go check that out. He has a YouTube channel. Everything about Larry will be in the description box. And once again, Larry, we appreciate you for your honesty and for, for all your information. For, for, Thanks, your, for, for a good history yeah. class. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Always a pleasure. Enjoy it. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so thank much. you. Hopefully we'll get right, to you take again. Take care. Bye -bye. Good to see you again, Larry. Thanks.